Hey everybody, Mark Holmes here. Thanks for watching my demo on photo collage in CS4. So this is the guy we're going to build today. I'll be fast forwarding through the construction of this alien out of photographic reference material collected from the web. So uh, this, this is a fairly straightforward guy, just the head of an alien, but I think it's going to be a good example of how to use found textures to assemble your image. So I don't know if you guys read the articles first or go straight to watch the videos. I tend to start with the videos. But, uh, so if you've read the text, this might, I might be repeating myself, but uh, try to keep this interesting. So I've been using the lasso tool here to just quickly sketch a rough shape for the head just to establish the height that I'm going to work inside. Um, just using the lasso and fill and some rough brushes. And you see that I'm, I'm mirroring. I'm going to mirror this whole construction just to save time in the interest of the demo, but it's also something that I might do uh, to very quickly generate a head since people tend to be symmetrical. Intelligent creatures with eyes and expressions tend to be symmetrical anyway, so it's just more natural like a human. Um, so I want to make this guy look uh, a little bit friendly, a little bit like uh, maybe some kind of mentor or uh, dare we say Jedi Council member. Okay, so here's the first image. Um, you're going to just see me drag pictures in from the other side. I have a bunch of images open on the other monitor. And I'm just going to be dragging them in and sculpting them into place. Um, I go into the tools in the article, but the steps are basically transform your image or warp, some kind of free transform, mask to create, to remove everything you don't want, and then use hue saturation to adjust the colors and uh, blend it in. So that's it. It's going to be repeating through this cycle of transform, mask, and hue saturation. That's the warp tool there, that grid. And this allows you to uh, move any of the control points on the edge or in the intersections in between, in the centers, and uh, give you a nonlinear kind of distortion, whereas transform, of course, is just rotate and scale. So here I'm going to apply the layer mask to this photo element. This is kind of a uh, little thing here, if you click that circle in a square button that's third from the left in the bottom of the layers palette right there. And now you can start masking away the image. So uh, as long as you're working on the mask rather than the layer by selecting that little icon beside the name, if you're painting in black, you're erasing. If you're painting in white, you're bringing back the pixels that you've erased. So uh, it gives you this flexibility. You can endlessly tweak what exactly you show and what is invisible. And you can go back and change it at any time. So I'm always going to be editing the transitions between these photo clips. You'll see as we start to get more than one in here. That bright red halo there you saw a few seconds ago, that's an option to turn on the visibility of the layer mask. So I don't usually do that because you can't see what you're painting. But um, if you want to just see where you've masked and if you've missed anything, you can toggle that red, vis uh, red marker on with the forward slash under the backspace key. Just to reiterate, if you're painting into the layer mask with black, it erases. With white, it returns the image. So you can uh, see I'm messing around the edge, removing and returning pixels just to, to get exactly the transition that I want. Mostly using the X key to toggle between the foreground and background color. You'll see the uh, black and white foreground and background color just swapping in the bottom of the toolbar there. Okay, so the third step of this transaction, processing a photo, is color. So I'm just going to pop open the uh, hue saturation panel, so that's control U. And that allows you to drag the sliders and modify the color of the pixel information you have here. So um, f I just know I want to get an established kind of an aquatic color scheme for this guy, like a fish man sort of thing. So um, red goes to green. And from now that you've got a color in mind, You'll be using this panel on every single clip to match the colors of whatever source you bring in and, and blend it in. Um, and then also commonly you're going to the levels, control L, to adjust the, uh, the value, uh, light, dark. Okay, so I don't know what I was doing here with this extra eye, but bear with me a minute. Um, well, I guess it just lets me show you how uh, 
you can copy a clip by just by holding shift and dragging it out and I have another layer with a duplicate of that eye on it and uh, and I can just go back into the layer mask and edit the transition and blend it in as if it was naturally there so uh, but what I'm really going to do here is get on to building the eye socket so this is just like what I'm drawing you scribble your head and then you draw in the eye and work outwards to the rest of the features so I'm going to grab a piece of an alligator or a caiman or something here. This uh, I know they have that kind of cartilaginous structure that I want to use for the eyebrow, so I'll grab it another clip. And the whole cycle begins again. Scale it roughly to size, mask out everything you don't want, fit it in there, and a hue shift to get it to blend. So that's going to be the repeating thing. I'm going to speed up in a minute here. I'm just sort of letting you see what I'm doing, and then we'll start fast forwarding. There's the hue shift there that finishes off this element. So let me just pile on a few more things to build up the side of the face here. Um, uh, the underside of the eyelid, another alligator piece. I'm going to use a bit of a leaf here and a crab for the mouth and uh, some weird Asian, Asian fruit for the uh, forehead. Um, probably most of this stuff isn't even going to show at the end. I'm just kind of massing it in. This is like an underpainting at this stage. Um, You can see how as all these layers develop and you have these elements, you can just keep moving them around, changing their relative size or position. Um, so just, you got to keep things flexible like that because you never know what you're going to change down the way. Um, so I'm going to mirror again here just to see what I've got. Okay, this is kind of a cool move here. Here's Bufo Americanus, the big ugly toad. Um, so this is kind of a uh, kind of neat here. I'm gonna use this frog's cheek and or sorry this frog's forearm and flank as the cheekbone for this creature. There's all kinds of undulations, uh, lots of big shape on this frog and when you turn it and rotate it and move everything you can't really tell what it was originally right It's completely taken out of context but it certainly serves as this interesting shape of this high cheekbone with this strange kind of uh, folds in the skin here. So this is why this text, this kind of texturing is completely different than 3D texturing. There's lots of good archives out on the, on the web for flatly lit 3D textures that you're going to use in modeling. But uh, without these kind of bumps and forms you see in the photograph of an actual creature, you can't do this kind of sculpting. I mean, it's this lighting information that I'm repurposing. So control U get into the hue, hue saturation panel, blend that in, and keep rolling, moving stuff around. So when I mirror it, I can see I don't really like the position of the eyes. The slant is too intense. Um, looks a little bizarre, so I'll just bring in that eyebrow again and rebuild the eye socket in a slightly altered position. Let me just fix that eye, set it deeper in the socket. Um, so see, because all these components are floating, you can just go back and make these alterations. Uh, it's really incredibly flexible, and uh, there's no repainting. Bringing in the coconut crab. I love these guys. These guys are awesome. This is a total Star Trek thing here, the bumpy alien forehead. But you can see why they do it. It's a big, smooth shape. You've got this large area to decorate on the forehead, and you can do whatever you want with it and not uh, alter the eyes, the, uh, which I mean, the character needs eyes if it's going to emote and act. Another good example of using an entire object or section of an object, the, the back of this crab serves covering the entire forehead here, and it's a, the shape works for this face. So it's sort of, a, I mean, it's fortuitous, it's almost too easy. I didn't say that. Edit that. Cut that out. But you got to let yourself have fun with these shapes and just find things. Happy accidents in here. Um, like this 
paw from a turtle, sea turtle. I love these claws, nice texture, and let's just, I just want to mess around and find somewhere to put this shape in because I think it's going to add something to the mix and it's a good balance. So far I haven't had to do this, make any finicky selections. I've just been using a big soft airbrush and blending, but uh, you know, if you have to get a sharp edge, then I'm using the lasso tool here and then I'll paint out the mask following that guide. So while generally all you ever need is the hue saturation panel, occasionally you run into a black and white object that doesn't really have any color to adjust. So um, you do have to do, in this case, some hand tweaking painting a little of that yellow flesh tone on top. Let's keep massing stuff in. Uh, go to the squid and start clipping out tentacles. Um, you know, this area, frankly, is probably looking a little rough. I'm pushing these photographs farther than they should go. I really don't have great photo source for these things, surprisingly. You'd think there'd be lots of photos of tentacles on the web. You know, they get the point across. It's I, I don't think that this area of the picture is really a crucial area. I mean, it reads, so it's doing its duty for now. I'm kind of making excuses. If this was uh, going to be a piece that you'd use for marketing or, uh, you know, it's really an important piece, then you really should spend more time on these tentacles. Maybe make one or two ideal ones and then build them up, deforming them in different shapes instead of trying to get so much material with a single photo. So uh, anyway, warts and all, this is how this is done. Meanwhile, I've been building up the mouth with uh, pieces of crabs and sea anemones. Um, I know I want to have a lot of fiddly detail around here, all these waving mouth parts and creepy mandibles. Okay, so back to Mr. Bufo Americanus. I do this a lot. I settle on one or two photos that have the main texture I'm using. It's logical. Kind of ties everything together. Right? Makes sense. So this thing with the mouth of the frog, I'm using his mouth because it's a line. And I like to extract lines out of the photos and use them to draw with on the form. It makes kind of this graphic shape, like a, this tendon or growth under the skin on the forehead. So I'm just going to quickly mass in a body, a torso here. Um, this isn't too crucial. I know I'm going to cover it later with a robe. So just make a dark shape and throw some buffo on there. Some of my frog texture, which is the under painting for everything on this. And it's just going to be really dark because it's you know, push it back in there and it's going to get covered up. So I'm still not satisfied with the eyes. So I'm just going to, I'm trying to put them back in there like they're set under those brows a little more. I give them a little more of an intense or at least a serious expression. And this is an opportunity to introduce just a little bit of asymmetry. One eye is open wider than the other, different arches to his eyebrows. So, um, I mean, this mirroring thing has gone on long enough. It's time to start breaking up that and put some stuff that, yes, breaks up the exact symmetry. So it's, it's a useful guide to get you somewhere, but you're not going to leave that raw mirroring in. <laughs> Did I mention lately there are really only three techniques here? Transform, hue saturation, layer mask. And yeah, I'm starting to feel bad because there's so little to this. But really, no, look, it's what you do with it, not the tools themselves. Okay, this is a little amusing. Hello, Mr. Jedi. This guy from the Jedi Council posted a nice big photo for us. Anyone know this guy? I'm sure he wouldn't mind if we use a bit of his robe. He's proud of his gear, right? Oh, and, and I'm going to combine fragments of some other garments. Just a habit. Never use too much of any one source. Uh, so the deal with copyright, you know, we're using all these other people's photos. People frequently say, what about copyright? You're a thief. You're stealing. Well, so the deal is, you know, as long as you're making a new work, modifying the source, creating something new out of it, and you know, follow the guideline of using parts, not the whole, then there's no problem. You're, you're not infringing. You're creating. I mean, the, uh, that's, the, that's the guideline, whether you're making a new work. So meanwhile, I've begun doing a little hand painting mainly organizing the shadows, painting in some darks on the undersides of forms, you know, and uh, just reinforcing some edges, adjusting the design. I'll bring back a little bit of light into the forehead and do a little hand painting up there. So I'm not really going to do a lot of this hand tweaking. There's no limit here. You can just keep going. I mean, these, these collages are meant to be rapid prototypes, but you could treat them as underpaintings for awesome renderings. You could just completely paint over this and leave no pixel untouched and you'd get something really cool. 
in a production setting, they, I haven't had the opportunity to do that. It'd be something, uh, be something that'd be fun sometime. But uh, you really, because these things are so convincing so quickly, and you're moving on to the next one and the next one, and and really your role as a concept artist is just is to kick out as many ideas as possible in the shortest time. Um, yeah, I don't do a lot of this hand tweaking commonly, so I'm not emphasizing it. But anyway, you get the point. Um, you could have a lot of fun with this. So not too much more left to do. You know, we're getting to the point where we can see what we've got, and I'm starting to think, what else can I do here, without, you know, thoroughly investing in a repainting, and changing something drastically. So yeah, it's, it's winding down. Um, just one more thing. I'll just pop into CS5 and do a pop and warp to put a little more asymmetry on these tentacles. Okay, so this is Puppet Warp over in CS5. It's a new kind of uh, version of Transform. So you've probably seen this by now. There's been videos on the web for a while, but it's kind of a new thing uh, at the time I'm doing this. It might be commonplace for you by the time the video comes out anyway. So the metaphor is you have these control points like pins. You can drop these pins anywhere on the image and they stick down your layer like, like pins in a bulletin board. So you can grab individual control points or sets of control points and, and pull on them to distort the image and the rest of the pins hold the information down, like your layer is tacked to the page. So that's kind of cool. It lets you do stuff like specifically alter the ends of these tentacles without dragging around the rest of the information. It's just a little more fine-tuned than warp. So it could be quite useful. Um, things like these tentacles you know, I was back I was saying I'm not really doing a very good job with these tentacles using one photo and just stretching the heck out of it. If I were to just render one beautiful tentacle kind of in a straight horizontal formation, then I could make it look sweet, pile as many layers as I wanted, and then bring that isolated object in and use this puppet warp to bend each one into the kind of curves that I want to create. So each of these tentacles, rather than being a clumpy mass, could be hand positioned using this stuff. So I think I'll probably be using it more when I start to just work in CS5 all the time. So that is pretty much it. Uh, after a few of those last weeks, um, here you can see the after all of the hand painted shadows and the final levels and curves adjustments, this is what it was like with just the raw photographic information that we collaged and with our final tweaks. So it's surprising how much that last painting session makes a difference There's before and after. I hope that was interesting to watch. Pretty simple, hey? Really, with this photo collage, you, can, you should be having all the fun designing your character without any of the pain of rendering all that texture. So, you know, it's really kind of a win-win. Great, huh? Uh, enjoy it, give it a try. Any questions, feel free to mail me, marktaro at hotmail.com, and uh, take care.